This morning we continue with our series, Jesus, Myth, Madman, or Messiah. And our scripture lesson is taken from the Apostle Paul's letter to the early church at Rome. Hear these words from the fifth chapter, verses six through eight. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The word of God for the people of God. Most holy and precious God, we thank you so much for just uh, the opportunity to come into your house today. Lord, I, I ask that you would just uh, open our hearts and our minds, that as we gather today, you might speak. Lord, uh, let me get out of the way and just uh, allow your word to fall in, in fertile soul. We love you, and we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to begin today with a, with a uh, point to ponder, and this is one thing you might want to write down. You know, understanding certain things about people can change our relationship and our future. I remember uh, that our youngest Sloan, when, when he was young, we lived in a little blue house and, and it was kind of a circular pattern and we would just make a, a race track around, but, but he found himself falling in love with a golf club. And he, you talk about some folks have a pacifier. Well, Sloan had a golf club. And he'd carry this golf club everywhere. He'd just drag it around. What we had then, it didn't matter if it was bro broken. And he broke a lot of stuff with it. But he'd drag it around. He was only about this big. The golf club was twice as big as he was. And we had a big dog named uh, Keisha. And Keisha was a, an Akita, weighed about... 90 or 100 pounds, and, and not a ferocious dog as long as you were friends with her, but, but we always worried that she might do something crazy if, if something crazy happened. Well, one day we were in the den, and, um, and I didn't know a lot about Sloan. He was just trying to kind of give me an idea of who he was, and, and he was with his golf club walking around, and, and the dog was sitting over there on the side, and, and Sloan was just innocently standing there and, and holding the golf club like this, and he let it go. And it landed right across the dog's nose. Whack out! Well, the dog jumped up and kind of and bolted, you know. And I'm thankful the dog didn't turn on on, on Sloan. But but what happened then was was kind of crazy. I looked at Sloan, and Sloan had this fear in his eyes, like, "Oh my gosh, what did I do?" And being the, the wonderful dad that I was, I walked over and gathered him up. And I said, man, it's okay. It's okay. It was an accident. You know, the dog's okay. Uh, why don't you go over there and tell the dog you're sorry? <laughs> Sloan looked at me with this puzzled, like, what? I said, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Just go over there and just tell the dog you're sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Sloan, tell the dog you're sorry. And with every time I told him his jaws would get... Well, before long, it was all I could do not to kill that kid trying to get him to tell him he was sorry. You know, it became a power struggle. <laughs> you know, and, and before the time was over, Tina was crying in the back, back, back bedroom. I'd... <laughs> This is film, right? I had torn that kid's hiney up so many times and finally sent him to his room. Well, after a while, Sloan came out and poked his head around the door and I said, boy, don't you come out of here unless you're going to say that dog, dog you're sorry. <laughs> and he nonchalantly turned around and walked back in his room. <laughs> well, some more time passed. Me getting more angry, Sloan just in control of the whole thing. <clears throat> and he came out and said, you better get over here and don't you even stick your head. So he finally walked out and just kind of walked over and I said, you better. And he, he walked over to that dog and I said, you tell him. And it was just about he reached down and smacked the dog on the head and said, sorry. <laughs> and walked off and I went, okay, I've won. That's good. That's good. I got it. <laughs> You know, like I said, understanding certain things about people can change our relationship and our future. And in all honesty, beginning to know what Sloan was like at his, his inner core allowed me to start dealing with him in ways that would allow me to have a, a much closer relationship with him. I knew that if I pushed him in certain ways, I would, would find myself in, in a power struggle and, and there were better ways with which I could, I could manipulate, I mean, uh, guide uh, his actions. 
Well, over the last few weeks, we, we have been on a journey hoping to find out more about this person we know as Jesus. If you look at my points to pond, I mean my, my, my preview, I, I talked about how fun it was to, to do those old connect the dots puzzles and how you would have a picture that had nothing there but dots, but as you began to move in ascending orders, there would come a time where pop, whatever was hidden on the picture would, would, would come to life and, and we'd be excited and, and finish out the drawing. Well, today I'm going to tell you that, that what we're going to talk about, it, I think, is, is one of those dots in our understanding of Jesus. It has the ability to, to truly allow our understanding of Him blossom become clearer you know it's important for us to, to get a handle on, on what the cross was all about and why Jesus would find himself going there for us over the years many have, have tried to, to give us an idea of what this, 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 this ugly thing stood for and why Christ going there would have made a difference in our life in the 1500s, there was a word that was developed. It was atonement. And the idea behind it was, was there was something that happened on this cross that, 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 that mended the broken path that we had with God, that somehow reconciled us to God or, or broke down the barriers, allowing us to have an at one meant with our Creator. And they came to be known as theories the atonement and there's all kinds of them there's no way that we can get to all of them this morning so I just want to touch on two that might give us a better understanding of, of really who Jesus was and, and how the cross Jesus dying on the cross can make a difference even though it happened 2,000 years ago how it can make a difference in, in who we are and how we live and experience life in our current day there are two things that, that I want to tell you about these theories. As I said, many have put forth ideas about what Jesus dying on the cross meant. But, but it's important to remember first that there's no one idea or understanding to get fully speak to everything that happened on the cross. I mean, there's no one idea that can, can, can allow us to understand why Jesus had to die in such an ugly way. The second thing that I want to tell you is that these beliefs or these theories of atonement, as, as beautiful pictures as they are, they can at best be seen as metaphors. Metaphors. That point us to a picture of, of what the cross was all about. How many of you think, I think they do a, a good job in doing that, but... but with, them, like with all metaphors, if you begin to push them too far, they begin to break down and cause problems. So today I want to share two. The first one I didn't write down, but you may want to put this down. The, the most popular idea, the most popular theory of atonement is known as the penal substitution theory of atonement. Penal substitution theory of atonement. And what that means is in the beginning, God created humanity, placed us in the garden, and at that time, we were intended to, to have an unbroken, continually connected relationship intimately with God. The Bible talks about Adam and Eve walking with God almost hand in hand through the garden. And that was how our existence was supposed to be until sin, what Adam and Eve did in their disobedience in the garden, took root. And believe it or not, we, we today have not been able to get away from that sin. So when, we, when sin came into the world, God being the righteous, just, all good God that God is, our sin created an uncrossable chasm between us and God. And since that time, we, we, that, that longing we have in our heart was, was trying to figure out a way that we might be reconciled find an atonement that would put us right back with God. The Bible talks about the fact that, that God is so righteous and so just that, that He cannot be with, with any type of sin. 
And so the only way that, that we, can, we can be in connection with Him is through, through Him punishing us in some way or some manner. Paul said in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. Our actions, because they're flawed, condemn us to, to separation from God, which is death. And through the penal substitution theory, what happens is because of who Jesus was, God's only Son, unblemished, righteous, came down to bear not only your sin and my sin, but the sin of all the world. You see, through that theory, someone had to suffer. And Christ, through His great love, suffered for us. And if you buy into this theory, and like I said, I, I think it's a, a great theory, but, 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 but the whole cross was about appeasing God's righteous anger and wrath towards who we are at our very core, disobedient and self-centered. But if we, we push that too far, that theory begins to break down just a little bit. I mean, is it true that... That the only way in which to forgive is through the punishment of others. I mean, when Jesus came down to, to walk the earth back in first century Palestine, he spoke of not a wrathful and vengeful God, but, but a God who in Luke 15 was compared to a, a loving father. Who when his son came to him asking for his inheritance, gave it to him and, and, and lovingly watched his son in a foreign country and spent all that the, the father had soared up and saved on wild living and loose women. And rather than that father being angry and vengeful, that father stood at the, at the door longingly looking for the son's return. Or how about the pictures of Jesus and who he actually spent time with? I mean, he, he ate with sinners. That's who he hung around with. And when we spent time with her, he didn't condemn them, but, but oftentimes he took that time sharing just how wonderful God was and, and how much God's love could change their direction and their understanding. And one of the things that, that frustrated the, the religious leaders of Jesus' time so much was Jesus kept walking around forgiving everybody too. The prostitutes, the sinners. And if you remember, he did that before he went to the cross. So even though there are scriptures that support and speak of God being, being angry and righteous towards our sin, our Savior gives us, to me, a much clearer picture of, of who God is and what God desires from us. I mean, the Bible does speak of animal sacrifice. And those events were, were very real and dramatic events in the life of, of both the richest to, to the most simple of people where they would bring things of value to be offered up for, for our atonement. The idea behind that was, was through those sacrifices, people would understand the weight of their sin, how their actions really were important and, and hurtful and But it also shared the, the truth of God's grace that even though no matter where we've been or, or what we've done, God is always willing to, to love and to forgive if, if we will just set our hearts right. You know, when we, we think about this penal substitution theory, 
and we think of the sacrifice that the Bible so often and vividly talks about. I mean, we have to ask ourselves, was it actually the animal's blood that gave us that forgiveness? Or was it something more? Could God have done it without the sacrifice, without that blood? Again, as we, as we think about ourselves, we, I don't think it would be fair to say that, that the only way we can be just and forgive someone else is by punishing them. I mean, that's not what Jesus taught in the Bible. Looking back on, on his life, remember all the, the, the mercy and, and the grace that he, he invited those who would follow him to, to share and experience. He said things like, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. When Peter the apostle came to him and said, How many times should I forgive someone who wrongs me? Jesus said, You've heard it said you should forgive them seven times. But, but here's what I say. You should forgive them 70 times seven. You know, as we think about God being sovereign and all-powerful, it has to plant that seed in our mind that, that God could have forgiven us without Jesus going to the cross and suffering and, and giving his very life for us. So if it could have been done without the cross, then, then there has to be some other message with which God desires us to know. And as we think about the cross, it, it was preceded by, by a trial. And they're the most religious people in the world. Not just God's chosen people, but, but the religious leaders of God's chosen people gathered along with the most powerful regime in the world at that time, the Empire of Rome. And together they brought to trial the Son of God. They brought him there because... He challenged their beliefs. He called into question those things that they had become comfortable with. Their way of understanding how the world needs to be put together. But as we think about that trial, I think we're supposed to see that it was not Jesus that was being judged, but, but those people that surrounded him there on that day. And us. And all humanity. I mean, as I, I think of myself and, and what it must have been like to have Jesus come and upset the apple cart of all these guys back in first century. They, their lives had been set in a way that, that worked for them and they were making living and they were able to do and, and they feel like they could be, feel good about themselves. And Jesus said, uh-uh, that's not it. Let me show you how it really works. I feel if, if Christ came into my life and did that, I might want to get rid of him too. Instead of being this Joe Holy preacher that I am, I, I might find myself going, you know, yeah, I think we could crucify him. Make my life much more easier. And what about Pilate? As he went and interrogated and questioned Jesus, it came to the point in the story and, and, and to the events that he realized that Jesus had done no wrong. And he went back to the, the crowd, hoping to, to say, I, I find no wrong in this man. And then comes that little verse in the scripture that, that is so heartbreaking, but so telling about, about us and our world. Where, Pilate, where the Bible says, Pilate, wanting to satisfy the crowd, had Jesus flogged. 
and handed him, handed him over to be crucified. How many times do we wanting to, to win the approval of those around us or, or just to be po popular or not stand out from the crowd, do things that we know aren't right? Do things that hurt others just for our own benefit. You know, when you think about it, the, the cross was, was meant to show that there's something definitely wrong with us. Something deep within us that needs to be delivered, to be changed, to be saved. And Jesus went to the cross and, and glancing at this wooden structure, we, we, we realize that, that grace, though free, is also very costly. And knowing that, each time we find ourselves thinking, wondering if we can forgive someone else, we, we glance at the cross and remember all Christ did for us. If we find ourselves in a position that we feel like we're beyond God's grace and we've done something that, that, we, that God could never look down and forgive, then we can remember that Christ's price, Christ's love, knows no bounds. The second theory of atonement that, that, that I like to talk about today is entitled the, the moral theory of atonement. And as we look at the claw, cross, there's a reality that, that us coming to understand just what it means for, for someone so precious, so innocent to die for someone else. Coming to that understanding cannot help but, but affect us and how we live. I heard a preacher tell a story of a guy named Brennan Manning. He was a Catholic writer and written a number of books, but, but in one of the books he, he tells a story about how he got his name. You see, he was born Richard Manning, and he was a Marine. And he was stationed behind enemy lines in North Korea during that conflict. And, and one day he was there with a buddy, His name was Ray Brennan. And they were in a bunker together just passing back and forth a, a, a chocolate candy bar. And, 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 and his buddy got the last bite. And as he took it, an unseen North Korean soldier lobbed a grenade into the bunker around them. Well, his buddy was, was the first one to see it. And... Manning says he almost nonchalantly just threw the wrapper away, fell on the grenade. The great grenade went off. The stomach, his stomach smothered the explosion. Manning said he, he was there in the bunker completely unharmed and, and untouched. Then he said, Ray looked up at me with kind of a, a wistful look and, and winked. And then he rolled over and he died. When Richard Manning came back from the war, he, he had his name legally changed to the last name of the man who saved his life. 
And from that time on, he would be known as Brennan Manning. He would live differently each day. Grateful for the loving sacrifice of someone else that allowed him to live. You know, we, we call ourselves Christian because supposedly we, we understand the, the great sacrifice that happened on this tree. What happened on that cross was meant to move us deeply to want to live and, and follow in the footsteps of, of the one that would love us so much that he would give up his life for us. I mean, how can we see him hang there on the cross while he's dying and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And not be willing to forgive those who wrong us. In understanding who Jesus was, it's, it's important to realize that, that Jesus went to the cross not to change God's mind and heart. God loves us. Jesus went to the cross to change ours. You know, our scripture today goes this way. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, as we, as we seek to, to piece together this puzzle that we call Christianity, it's important that we recognize the sacrifice, but also the love that was shown on the cross. And by understanding that, that, that we might change our own hearts and open ourselves to receive and, and share the forgiveness. They can do nothing less than change our world. Let's pray. Precious and holy God, we thank you so much for the countless ways that we experience your grace, your mercy, and your love. It's true that oftentimes we, we forget about the great sacrifice and, and the love that was shed that has opened us to the abundant life that you offer. And Lord, no matter where we are today, you never close that door. Within our community of faith today, there are those that have never heard your gospel message that may need to say, Lord, I, I want some of that. Others find themselves in, in lifestyles where they have allowed temptations and sin to, to threaten their marriage, their vocations, their happiness. There are many here that they are struggling emotionally. They feel as if they don't matter or they're unloved. Today, help us to, to, to open our heart and receive that which you offer. Allow your Holy Spirit to wrap our brokenness, our pain, our voids, and, and make us new. 
Lord, we love you. Help us to live in your love. These things we pray in the name of your precious Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ.